There are times on Monday mornings where I wish that never-ending coffee cup thing was real. Oh, I'm with you right there. Yeah, right now. because because <laughs> I'm like I'm ready to go, uh, but then also we were supposed to have snow this morning, and then I didn't really get any snow, so that was a little bit of a that was oh, a little rough. One. I know. Yeah, I kind of wish I kind of wish we had, but you can see a little bit of snow on there. It is Portland, and uh, if you didn't know, a quarter inch can shut the entire city down. But <laughs> somehow we made it in here we because <laughs> we do. We make it in here regardless of the terrifying snowstorm that uh, hit Portland. We are here because we love being here every day. This is Digital Trends Live. This is our daily show here from Digital Trends where we bring you the trending tech topics of the day, interviews, all kinds of different segments, and we have a fun one lined up for you. We're broadcasting live on Twitch, Periscope, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So no matter which platform you're finding, you can drop in your comments and questions to us throughout the show. On the docket today, though, it's a big one. So right now in Barcelona, Mobile World Congress and MWC is happening. This is the world's biggest mobile technology conference. And we have people who are live there who are gonna be joining us live on this show. So like I said, we're in Portland, but we're gonna be going live to Barcelona. We're going back and forth. We've got, I believe we've got Jeremy Kaplan, our editor in chief and Julian Chocatu, our mobile editor, who are gonna give us the rundown of all the exciting things that have been happening, happening at MWC. There's a lot of really cool new phones that have come out, some new concept phones, some that may work, some that may not, but we're gonna be talking about all of that. So if you have questions, get those in there. It's gonna be about 20 minutes from now, we'll be talking to them. But right here in studio, I'm Greg Dibbler, joined by Nicole Rainey. Hello, Nicole. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for coming in here with us today. It's always fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. We braved the, uh, braved the ice. <laughs> we the braved it, outside. yes. We braved it in here for you who, who watches this show, uh, all to make it there. Hello to Jose, who is uh, I'm seeing on Facebook right now, and I'll hop around to all of our different platforms. We've got uh, Mike and Mike and Vicky uh, all there on Facebook, dropping in their comments and questions. So uh, let us know what that is as we go through uh, the show. Let's uh, start off, though, since we're going to be getting heavy into the mobile side of things here in a little bit, I figure maybe we'll do a little bit of mobile here at the beginning. So last week, Samsung was the was the biggest headline all week long for the Samsung Unpacked event, where they finally debuted several different phones, but one of the key ones is that foldable phone. So the Samsung Galaxy Fold, now officially out there, I think, I'm not sure if you can pre-order it yet or not, but they're saying late, uh, I believe it's sometime in April when it's actually gonna come out, but they released a video over the weekend that finally shows it a little more in depth. And so that's what we're looking at right here. Uh, previously, it's just kind of been their ones on stage. I didn't even think any of the editors got their got to get their hands on it. So at least now we're getting to see a little bit more of what it looks like. And you know, it's it doesn't look quite as quite as bulky as I thought it would. Exactly. I, I was kind of impressed by how slim it actually turned out to be. Yeah, when it folds down, it it looks you know more like a, a normal phone. I mean, it's definitely a little bit thicker than what we're used to, which would make sense. Um, but the way it folds up is actually, it's, a, it's, it's pretty cool. I, li I like looking at that. Yeah, me too. And I'm kind of excited, right? Like you said, I'm, uh, I'm interested to tune in later when you start talking to some of the folks at MWC because this folding phone trend is pretty big right now. Yeah. And I know very little about it. So I'm really interested to learn more. Like, I want to know why people, why, why is everybody on this right now? And that's, and that's a good point. I mean, I think part of it is, you know, phone companies are just trying to find some new way to innovate because we've kind of had the same thing for a long time, the same general form. Um, so it's just thinking, of, thinking outside of the box and things they can do since they can fold that, uh, that OLED screen. And so, you know, working that into, into where that is. I'm still curious about the software side of it. The video that they posted, and we'll have a link at Digital Trends too that you can take a look at, uh, kind of shows a little bit more of what you can do with the software. They showcase the, the camera, the camera side of it. I mean, that's neat, but that's not something that I feel like we haven't seen before. Uh, but the being able to have it on the one front screen and then open it up and immediately transition into having that, you know, twice as wide on the on the wide section. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. I can see definitely some things with maps being being used for that. But at nineteen nineteen hundred dollars, like two thousand dollars, two thousand dollars needs to do a little more than that for me. But I guess it's. I mean, you're, I guess you're kind of combining your phone and a tablet purchase into one. Like theoretically, you would In only theory. need. Only one device, but you have both sizes available. And that's true. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I guess as far as price-wise, mm -hmm. if you're if you're going to do that, uh, still. Well, I'm seeing uh, Jose said uh, kind of a small front screen for the price, but what do I know? And I agree. That's one thing that was a little bit surprising to me because the the third screen, the front screen, which is probably the one you would be utilizing the most if you're using it as a phone, mm -hmm. walking around making calls, is pretty small. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering why they didn't go full screen on that. I don't know. 
Well, I mean, we know that there's multiple screens. We know it can fold. Um, yeah. We know it can take photos. Uh, but can it still take calls? I'm not sure yet. I haven't seen anybody uh, talk about that. <laughs> it, I would hope so for $2,000. Uh, it should take calls. Um, but yeah, but with that smaller screen, mm -hmm. Then I don't know. Is that? Is I that think we'll it? just have to hear have to hear more from Julian later. Yeah, I don't think Julian's been able to get his hands on this one either because they've been so secretive with it. But I believe he did get his hands on with the Huawei phone. Oh, okay. Or at okay. least got to see more of that. So Huawei has a foldable phone that came out uh, at MWC. They announced theirs, and then I think LG has kind of a unique version that they're going. That's kind of a foldable phone. So there, there's definitely a, some new some more news that we'll have about that. But that's coming up here in our segment in just a little bit where we'll go live to Barcelona with uh, Julian Tricatu and, uh, and Jeremy Kaplan. And yeah, keep dropping in your comments or questions. So yeah, if you do want to know more about any of these phones that are coming out, I can ask them. They're the experts. They've been there at this. And so they've seen them. So when that, that segment comes up, I'll try to gather all those and, uh, and we'll, we'll get some questions answered or at least find out some more about what's gone on over the weekend. Uh, all right. Maybe it's time we do a little bit of read them and weep. This is our segment here on the show where we do take a look at the comments and the questions that come across over the weekend on our many different platforms. We've got videos and articles that go up all the time. We cover a lot of different technologies. So whatever you're interested in, we've probably got a segment that covers that. And, uh, and people like to comment on those. It's the internet. Who knew? Who knew? People like to leave comments. Um, so we're going to take a look at some of these. Let's see. Uh, Alan Scott regarding hands-on Nokia 9 PureView review, next gen cameras. This is the, do the dog's bullocks. <laughs> Nokia is back. Alan, okay, if I could do a really good British accent, I feel like that's what's necessary right there. Um, dog's bullocks, nice, nice, getting me to say that. It, right can here. you tell if that's a, a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a good thing. I think it's good, but yeah. it could be bad. Yeah, this is the dog's bullocks, or it's this is the dog's bullocks. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Depends on how you go. Yeah. By the way, terrible British accent. I don't want any <laughs> box all over that. Do it again, do it again. <laughs> this is the dog's bullocks. <laughs> oh god, that's terrible. This is, this, that's awful. Uh, we shouldn't do, I should never do that. That's the next read of and weep segment. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> reading everything accent. in a terrible accent. We'll, maybe we'll get Andy Boxall to uh, respond to that, and he can let us know. Yeah, I need to know if good. it's actually good or bad, if he's excited or not. Yeah. Well, anyway, either way, uh, Nokia is back. And I think we're going to be talking about that specific phone, because I believe Julian Maven have that in hand. Um, for uh, for later on in that. That's segment. exciting. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Alan. Thank you very much. We appreciate the comment. I Whichever have, way it was supposed to I'm go. I'm submitting my question now. Then, if Julian has yes. that phone, I want to know if it's the dog's bollocks. Is it the dog's bollocks? That'll be my first <laughs> question that I asked Julian. Uh, Curtis Snyder, why a 19-year-old Bitcoin millionaire built a working Doctor Octopus suit. Builds exoskeleton that is similar in style to the one made by Doctor Octavius. Digital trans post copy. Real life Tony Stark. Shake my head. I can kind of see where you're going with that one. Mm -hmm. So there was there was a post that we put up because they we called him a real life Tony Stark. Um, I see where you're going. You know that's not Tony Stark. That was Doctor. Yeah, it was Doctor Octopus who made that suit. I think it was just saying that you know he's uh, inventing things. We're yeah. going with a general idea there. Yeah. Well, I mean, we can go back and just keep adding in all of the superheroes and events <laughs> too. And find one that fits in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I get where you're coming from. I'm appropriately. Uh, invested in the universe enough that I, I can hear you. I hear you. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. I'll definitely bring that up to our, to our copy editor, or our post copy team. And be like, excuse me, actually, there shouldn't be Tony Stark is mentioned in this. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get that in there. Uh, all right. How do, you, how do you say that with the umlaut over there? Mathaus? I'm not gonna. Mathaus? I'm not gonna attempt any sort of accent at this point. Maddie, uh, regarding hands-on Nokia Nine, the case the same one. Phone. No SD card slot. What in the world, Nokia? With those large photo sizes, uh, especially raw uh, DMG, you're going to need a lot of space, and not having a card slot is stupid. Um, but yeah. most phones don't even have that now, anyways. There's a lot that don't. I mean, I'm still on. Actually, does mine have it? Now that I think about it, I believe my Samsung does have an SD card slot. Yeah, I mean, with internal memories mm -hmm. uh, getting pretty big. I get what you're saying, though, like file, uh, you know, trying to get those files off of your phone if you have some really, like, high file. Uh, yeah. High file, fo I don't know what I'm trying to say. High file I, size photos? Uh, yeah. <laughs> high file, fi high size <laughs> file photos. Just stop trying to say It's Monday. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I mean, yeah, getting them off the phone, that definitely, yeah, would be an issue. But I think while, we're, while we're asking for stuff, like, I want uh, headphone jacks in all of my phones. Yeah. I also want uh, the ability to change out battery packs. I really miss that. 
Yeah. And nowadays, like I used to be able to like take out my battery and then put in like a backup one. Did you have like, like carry around a spare battery? Yeah, just in case. So if we're just asking for old school tech, then yeah, I want I want those things as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the more we shoot like 4K videos, I think if the, if the, if you're referencing that, and I don't know uh, yet if that Nokia 9 one does that. I haven't even read the review myself yet. We'll have Julian on; he can talk about that. Uh, but yeah, the higher the res, these some of these videos, then definitely that's gonna be that's gonna be an issue as far as storage. You need enough storage on there, and then to be able to get those those cards. So out. now we got two questions from Julian. Yeah. Is the Nokia phone the dog's bollocks, and <laughs> uh, what are they trying to do to help out with file size and transfer? Yeah, and how much storage? Yeah, how much storage does it have, and how? Yeah, can you transfer it? Okay, good good questions. Um, all right, Maddie, as I'm gonna go, and I'm probably that's probably not right, but. Uh, Good question. Good point that you have on there. All right, Adam Austin, regarding this smartphone case, can make you a cup of coffee. In 2019, when we should be reaching for the stars, but instead we marvel at being able to pour a cup of coffee from a smartphone. Not exactly the right stuff. I'm not sure if that was a New Kids reference or where we're going there. But <laughs> with, uh, I mean, I think you can enjoy both things. Yeah. Does it have to be one or the other? We could, we could be reaching for the stars, yeah. and we can get our smartphones to pour us coffee. I'm I, okay with that, right? I now. like both of those things. I mean, I think in space, you're going to need a smartphone to pour the coffee anyway. It's too, it's too hard to do it. There you go. Yeah. And we do, have, we do actually have something to talk about with that space side of things uh, coming up here. I'm not sure how many more read em and weep questions we have, but as we're going through this... Um, yeah, Adam, I mean, you can like both things. We can like both things. Uh, all right, Larry Grossman, this is our last one here for Read em and Weep. Regarding engineers, built a new camera capable of taking pictures in five dimensions. There's a oh, fifth dimension. Oh. Beyond that, which is known <laughs> to man, it is a dimension as vast as space and timeless as infinity. It is a middle ground between light well, wait, and no, shadow. Wait, you got to do the impression now. Between science and superstition. Uh, no, no, that's no, that I went to the uh, Rod Serling impression. Man. Yeah. If I had had to know if I was, I was going to have to do so many impressions. Larry, I'm I'm so impressed because you have like the entire so the entire spiel right now, but then you misspelled Twilight Zone. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> that's a good point. You went all so the you got way all through. the way to the end, and then Twilight is yeah. uh, misspelled. So close, yet so far away. <laughs> and uh, apologies, yeah, there, Larry. It just didn't quite didn't quite uh, finish it out there. Um, can you do a Rod Serling impression? Oh, no. I already okay. said impressions are out. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry impressions. we're lacking in the impressions on this show. We will we will work on that. We had Terry Fader on last week. I mean, you can, if you want some more impressions, we definitely had him, uh, him on there. Uh, Keelan just said, so that fifth dimension is 5G. I'm sure there's some kind of conspiracy theory we're going to have that will wrap into that. <laughs> somebody, somebody will be on the phone about that one. All right, let's go on to some other news stories here as we're walking through. And again, if you're watching live, thanks for tuning in. Drop in your comments, your questions, and we will get to those coming up here in just a few. We're going to be talking more about Mobile World Congress because we're going to be going live to Barcelona with Jeremy Kaplan, Julian Trocatu, to run through everything that they've found out over this last, uh, last couple of days that they've been over there in Barcelona. Um, first, though, Catch you up on some news that happened kind of over the weekend, Friday and through this weekend. Virgin Galactic. They are in the news because they have finally put up a tourist into space. Well, a passenger. A passenger. A she's, passenger. she's actually like the, the yeah. head of astronaut training or something. She's not a tourist. Yeah. yeah. And that's true. She's not a tourist, but she was in the spot of where a tourist would be. So Virgin Galactic is one of the companies, you know, racing with like SpaceX to get people into space. This video that they posted is really cool, actually, showcasing the um, the VSS Unity, which is the Spaceship 2. I'd almost want to run this a couple of times just because it's I find this so interesting. And uh, so they managed to climb to its highest ever altitude, flying at 55.85 miles, 90 kilometers above the Earth, which is just short of the generally agreed upon 62 mile boundary, which is recognized as the start of space. So to uh, the comment we just got that mm -hmm. we're, we should be reaching for the stars, they did. Virgin Galactic did over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they got up there, so that counts as a suborbital space flight because uh, it's, it reached outer space, but it didn't quite get out of the atmosphere. So it's suborbital, suborbital. Say that 10 times fast. Um, <laughs> But yeah, above board the craft, you were right. So the chief astronaut instructor, Beth Moses, and pilots Mike Such, Masucci, and Dave McKay, uh, they were the three that were on board that. But uh, Beth Moses was carried in the passenger cabin. So. She was the first official passenger Yeah, via Virgin Galactic. Yeah, which is really, really cool to me. I love this idea of increasing space travel and, and being able to go up. It's a little bit out of my price range. Just a little bit. 
Just a little bit. Uh, right now, you can book a ticket on Virgin Galactic, but the trip is going to cost you 250 grand for a 90-minute flight. Now, it hasn't quite started yet. They're still in these testing phases, but we're getting close. I want to go back to, to Beth's job for a second, uh -huh. chief astronaut instructor. Her job is literally to to see what it's like uh, to be the passenger yeah. and then train us, well, us, train people with the right amount of money yeah. to be able to handle that experience. It's such a neat job. That's a pretty cool <laughs> job, yeah. Like, oh, I'm just going to go up in space a few times and tell you what it's like. And I mean, I'm sure it's a very hard job, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Also, she gets a card that says chief astronaut instructor. That That's awesome. Come on. I mean, that's that's pretty badass. Uh, well, so, uh, and she she had a message for company founder Richard Branson just saying, Richard, you're going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and she described it as an indescribable ride. So, it sounds amazing. And seriously, that footage is so great. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I want to do this. Would you go up if the price... Remove the price? Yes, yeah, absolutely. You would do it. Oh, oh okay. yeah. Even with I've... the risks involved. Oh, and... of course. Okay. I would too. So, uh, Virgin Galactic, if you would like uh, to send uh, some journalists up there, we will absolutely be the ones to go we, up there. We could test it. it. Yeah, yeah, you know, if you're even if you're concerned about some stuff, mm -hmm. it's fine. We'll we, we'll put our bodies at risk. Yep, <laughs> we'll do a whole segment on DT Live if you send us up into space. I'd have a few more words to say than Beth Moses if you need something <laughs> to add on to it. You know. See, there you go, Virgin Galactic. Let's try to let's try to work on this. Uh, either way, I'm that sure is... I'll love it too, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we won't know until we try it. So uh, we'd love to f try that out. So Virgin Galactic, yeah, the VSS Unity Spaceship 2. And they're in the race, you know, with Elon Musk. And as we've said before here on the show. Space race. Space race. We've got Elon Musk versus Richard Branson versus Jeff Bezos. Who takes the lead right now? I believe I last mean, time you had Jeff Bezos. Yeah, last time I had Jeff Bezos, but I mean, I feel like I just got to pick somebody new each time, right? So yeah. Richard Branson uh, just got a shout out from space. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Richard's in front. Right All right, now. Richard just took the lead because this is our, our Richard never Jeff. Then Elon. Oh, Elon's dropped Yo, he all the dropped, way down. Yeah, he's dropped a few notches. And this is our whole idea of that the three of them need to get into the ring for a battle royale and uh, who would come out on top. And so now it looks like Richard Branson, yeah, just Nicole officially setting the rankings. <laughs> I'm sure in Vegas right now they're determining this. They're like, all right, we got to change it up. So <laughs> bets are being placed. All right, let's go to a couple other stories here. There we have a couple other topics from the weekend. Uh, this one is something that unfortunately I feel like we're gonna be hearing more of as we mm -hmm. go on. And it took place in New York where a man was arrested over the weekend for shooting down a drone. It's that uh, cops on Long Island have arrested a man on suspicion of shooting a DJI quadcopter out of the sky. I'm not surprised. Not surprised. I believe there was somebody in New Jersey who did this before who shot a drone out of the sky. It's New York is, seems to be really a hub for this. Um, so this took place in a small community of St. James, about 50 miles east of Manhattan. So the drone was a Mavic 2 Zoom. And the thing is, it was being used for a really good purpose. Mm -hmm. So it was a local volunteer group that specializes in searching for lost pets. So this, this group, they're, they're just out there trying to find a lost dog. There was a dog who was, who was lost. And so they were searching like drain pipes or some kind of drainage, uh, drain ditches for this lost dog. And this dude came out there. Uh, his name is, uh, I'll get his name, he's actually in, named in the Gerard Chastain, 26-year-old Gerard Chastain, and he fired three shots at it before he was able to knock it out of the sky. You know, I'm a little surprised, too, because uh, reading our article on digitaltrends.com, uh, there's only, like, a little bit more than a dozen cases in the past few years, there's, so there's not as many of these cases as you would think. Yeah. But I wonder if this if they're going to increase as drones become more prevalent. Yeah. Because a lot of times people are using it now for recreation, uh, but like when, pe when more and more people use it for, um, like the police have been testing it out, we've talked about that before on Digital Trends Live. Yep. Um, this group is using the technology to try and locate a lost dog. I just keep wondering, like if, if the more and more we send these up for non-recreational uses, so they are flying near people's property for to see this more and more. Yeah, people just getting upset and, and shooting. I mean, I, I, you know, I get if somebody's like hovering in your backyard, mm -hmm. but at the same time, this is going to be part of reality. We have to get used to it. And it's a aspect. federal crime now. It, yes. The FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, said it was a federal crime to shoot down a drone because it's aircraft sabotage. Yeah. I mean, well, just the fact, too, that he shot it off three times in his backyard. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's not wise anyway. But as far as like the privacy issue, mm -hmm. 
like the overall issue. How do you feel about that? And if you're watching, I want to know how you feel. Do you think this guy should have shot down this drone? Uh, do you want to have some way to like zap people to keep them from flying around? Regardless, because I guess he didn't know the intent of this drone. You know, they want to see his secrets. Uh, I'm kind but, of on the fence. Yeah. Because I feel like on one hand, we talk about privacy, but like Google Earth can already see into my backyard. Well, if I had a backyard, I live in an apartment. But, yeah. you know, you could already, with satellite technology and uh, all of the things that we like allow our phone, like the data that we allow our phones to access to, like our privacy is already kind of something that's up in the air. Yeah. But so I, I definitely understand the desire to you know, kind of like keep your property to yourself or not. We, we were talking about this with uh, before about facial recognition technology, mm -hmm. about people implementing that in public spaces and like how that's kind of weird. Yeah. But it's one of those things where it's like the, it's already happening. Like it's already, yeah. you know, people can already see like what our yards look like. They can already see like where our property lines are. Yeah. So I'm not really sure what the big concern is here. Right. Well, I think it's maybe lack of education about them or just general paranoia. Yeah. That people have. Yeah, I mean, I would be really freaked out if a drone was just all of a sudden flying. Yeah, around. paranoia, guns, and new technology is probably a bad combo. A bad combo. That's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad triple combo right there. Uh, but yeah, that's that's definitely something we're gonna have to start figuring out as we go through because we're gonna see more and more drones, especially once the delivery side of things uh, goes up. I'm seeing a comment there. Keelan said, screw these idiots. Let the drones shoot back. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know about that. I don't that. know if I'm ready for that yet. Because, Not ready. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I do think shooting a drone out of the sky is a bit much, although I would be annoyed if somebody's huddering, mm -hmm. you know, hovering around in my Absolutely. backyard. Yeah. Or, you know, and thinking about it, too, we have uh, streets that sort of that uh, limit traffic around our places. Mm -hmm. But the sky above us isn't as like well regulated. Yeah. So if you're talking about like delivery drones coming around mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff or just people being able to fly their drones willy nilly, it's kind of weird because you have like fences to sort of like protect your backyard from traffic. Yeah. You know, so you can do whatever right. you want in your backyard, but then for somebody to just like fly over that. Right, and, just you know, violates that whole sense of security. Yeah, I, I get it, but I still wouldn't shoot anything down. But again, yeah. that's the, uh, I guess it's kind of like the extreme reaction there. Uh, there are a couple of comments too. Uh, Justin says, is there any way to mark the drones as working drones for police or, or, uh, or this dog rescue, special paint or something? Yeah. Different colors? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, sometimes something like that. Maybe we need some regulations. And that's actually one thing that NASA is uh, is working on right now. So they're testing. This is another story actually that we have. So they're testing advanced drone traffic control systems, and to figure out when we do start getting these um, these these you know drone delivery systems, like how are we going to regulate that? How's that going to work? And so they're testing out something right now. They've got two different groups, and this is actually going to be happening. So if you're in the Reno area, or Corpus Christi. So Reno in March, or March and June, Corpus Christi in July and August, you may start seeing a whole bunch of drones flying over your city because they're gonna be testing out this idea for new traffic control lanes for, uh, for drones. And this is something, you know, you're gonna see it. I think it's interesting they chose Reno and Corpus Christi. And you actually uh, have something to yeah. say about the Corpus well, Christi Well, I'm side. from Corpus Christi. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this should be pretty interesting because uh, we all know that Texas has a lot of people who are armed. Um, so hopefully yeah. we yeah. don't see a repeat of this New York incident. <laughs> uh, it does seem like a bad idea as far as where you're, where you're going to be flying those over. But there's a, there's a Texas A&M University campus in Corpus Christi, and they have a, a really awesome uh, like branch of that university who's been doing uh, drone research yeah. for a while. And same thing in, in, uh, in Reno. They have the Nevada Institute for Autonomous Systems. Yeah. Uh, so both of these places have already been studying drones. So they're trying to use the, the, the cities as sort of like testing grounds, like what you were saying, to yeah. see what drone traffic looks like. Yeah, this. I wonder if they'll be announcing that to everybody, or if we're just gonna be walking around all of a sudden, it's just like fleets. Of oh, drones. They, they've announced it. Yeah, okay. people. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> one of the first things I did was like Google the reactions in my yeah. uh, like hometown to see what everybody's saying, but Get all negative so far. It's uh, and I and I'm a, I don't know about the Reno uh, the Reno location, but in Corpus they're looking to test like downtown, yeah, or monitor stuff in downtown because it makes more sense because you have to like take into consideration like building height and things like that. Yeah. Um, so that should be really I'm I'm really fascinated by this. It's really cool that it's happening in Corpus. Yeah. Well, we'll find out. I mean, we've got the article up at Digital Trends. You can take a look there and, and uh, chime in with whatever you think about that. Looks like a lot of people have opinions on that, so maybe we'll have to do a drone segment again later on. But right now, we need to go to break because we're going to be heading 
to Barcelona. Yes, Barcelona, via the magic of the internet right here on Digital Trends Live. Nicole, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me. This is always so much fun. And like I said, we're broadcasting live so we can take your comments and questions. Now is the time to get those in there about anything you've been reading about when it comes to Mobile World Congress, to MWC, when it comes to phones, because we've got some experts who have been there who are going to be talking about it, kind of running us through everything they've seen, uh, all while broadcasting live across all of these different platforms. So stick around with us. Back in a minute with more Digital Trends Live. Live. Thank you, everyone, for joining us wherever you are. We really do appreciate it. And I know we're broadcasting live across a number of different platforms, which means we can take your comments and questions as they come in. So drop those in there. I'm already seeing some coming in on LinkedIn Live, where we're uh, live as well. And uh, I'm Greg Nibbler, but right now, this is so much fun with this show because we can take you anywhere in the world. And we are heading to Barcelona right now, where we're joined by Jeremy Kaplan and Julian Trocatu. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, let's test the connection here. Can you hear me right now? Okay, fantastic. How are you guys doing? Well, I've had three hours of sleep. Yeah, we're getting <laughs> maybe a little bit slap happy out here. Yeah, I was going to say, so uh, Julian, just to catch everybody up, you went from New York to San Francisco for Samsung Unpacked, came up here to Portland. You were actually on Digital Trends Live on Friday and then now are in Barcelona. Um, yeah, who knows? So three hours of sleep, it sounds like, maybe. Um, but somehow you are powering through. I'm sure you're going to collapse the rest of the week, but we appreciate you being on here today. Yeah, of course. It's, uh, it's fun, so that's, that's what's keeping me going, I guess. <laughs> well, let's start walking through some phones. So a lot of announcements over this weekend, and uh, and I think all of us are just trying to catch up, which is why we're. this is so nice to have you guys on here with us right now. Um, there's a bunch of ones we want to go through. Uh, why don't we start off with, I, I think, one that I thought was kind of an interesting announcement as far as technology and changing things up, and that's the LG uh, G8 uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Think. Uh, they they would prefer if you said Think Q. Think Q. Okay, sorry. Just want to make sure that I got the right. So the LG G8 Think Q, and uh, there's something pretty unique about this one. Can you go ahead and walk us through that? Right. So the LG G8 Think Q has a uh, pretty similar phone overall compared to last year's phone, but there's this new little uh, sensor on the on the sort of notch uh, where the selfie camera is. It's called a Z camera. And essentially, it's a time of flight sensor, which helps measure depth. So the real sort of feature here is that you can either uh, unlock the phone by placing your hand sort of over the screen or the camera, and uh, it recognizes the vein pattern on your hand. So you're basically unlocking the phone uh, by it recognizing your veins. And they said that it's super secure and very hard to uh, forge, I guess, which sounds right, right? Kind of hard to Someone's veins. How are you going to make something like that up? Right. Yeah. So it's essentially a biometric sensor that's built into this phone, which is very neat. We yeah. love seeing innovation of all sorts. Yeah. And, and that also is uh, built into the face unlock. So you can basically do secure face unlock, which is also cool. But the other sort of crazy feature is that you can use your hand to control certain parts of the phone without ever really touching it. So, for example, you can sort of do this and like do this little gesture above the camera. And then you can do either like open YouTube or to open another app, you know, and uh, you can play it and pause music video 
and you can all even this was really cool you can actually change the volume by just doing this which is very natural i feel like you know that's something that you kind of think yeah if i just do this and turn it off um but you do have to be kind of close to the camera so it can be a bit limiting in terms of how the uh how you interact with it when it, where it's placed chances are i think this might be used when the phone's laid flat on the table uh as lg also said that this isn't really meant to be used when you're like out walking and about that would be kind of ridiculous if you're out the street <laughs> yeah you right. know, <laughs> fuck. but so there's specific use cases that they said like say you're you know chopping up vegetables in the kitchen or you're in the bath and you don't want to you know get your hands wet or you get the phone wet and instead of having to touch these things uh, touch the phone just you know do, the, do these little hand gestures and it also uh, gives you sort of jedi powers over control over your phone oh, we can make this happen like this <laughs> yeah it just feels cool yeah Okay, I, I like this idea. I do like, uh, there's a video up to you, I should say, for pretty much everything that we're talking about, there's a full review at digitaltrends.com. Go there and take a look at those. I did like the video of Julian this morning. I was kind of walking through them, and I had it, had it muted, and all of a sudden it was just a picture of you sitting in a bathtub, uh, fully clothed, and I'm like, what is going on in this? But now, now I get the context. <laughs> to showcase how you, can, uh, how you can manipulate the phone without actually having to touch it if your hands are wet. This makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have that. So that's the LG G8. Thank you with that kind of uh, interesting new way of controlling the phone. Some definitely some innovation there. We also have the LG V50. Thank you. And this is a 5G phone. Is that right? Yeah. So it's going to be it's LG's first 5G phone. It's going to come to Sprint first, then Verizon in the spring. Um, well, Sprint uh, in the spring and then Verizon in the summer. Uh, but you know, it's basically similar again to the last year's LG V40. Upgraded specs. A couple of features from the G8, none of the, the air gestures that we just talked about, but uh, it's the 5G story that's really the, the cool feature there. Uh, but also there's another cool feature. There's a separate accessory that you can buy, and it then turns the phone into a foldable phone. I mean, it's not a foldable phone in the sense of like, say, the Huawei Mate X or Samsung's Galaxy Fold, where the screen actually folds. But as you can see the video, basically it's a separate screen edition that you put onto that phone and there's like feed software features that enable that you to like transfer what you're seeing on one screen to the other screen or swap them around. And in doing so, basically you get two full screens, you can totally multitask and it seemed pretty well thought out and uh, doesn't require an extra battery to charge that. Uh, it just wirelessly charges from your LG V50. Um, the only downside is that it's not gonna be available in the US. So sadly, oh. none of us really get to buy it. Uh, even though the B50 will definitely be here. Did they say which markets they were targeting with it? Uh, they just said not the U.S. Not the US. So <laughs> I guess everywhere else. But. Personally, I think that's probably related to the 5G issues. We're seeing an incredible amount of 5G announcements here, but one of the real limitations is where are you going to actually get 5G? So of course it's rolling out nationwide. There are plans for U.S., North Korea, Japan, China, uh, Asia, Africa, wherever. Um, but where are the actual networks that these phones are going to live on? At first, that might be a real limitation here. So one thing we can, I can speak to is that I was at Sprint's press conference earlier today, and they just said that, you know, the LG V50 is going to be their first 5G phone on their network, and they're expecting it to go live in May, starting with Chicago. Uh, also, 20 square kilometers of or square miles of Chicago. So small area of Chicago, but then they're going to go live with eight other major cities, including New York, Washington. So um that's sort of going to happen throughout the year. But again, in these cities, it's going to be small areas, uh, which is what basically 5G is going to be about for the next year or two. I think it's going to be, yeah, pockets in little cities, and then it'll fall back to 4G LTE for the meantime. I feel like that's a thing that a lot of people are still kind of getting their minds around because you hear 5G, it's like, great, I want that right now. It is going to take a while. You know, unless you're in one of these specific areas. And if you are, that's awesome. Good for you, because then you get to try all this stuff out. Um, but that's that's cool. I mean, it's it's. I guess it's fun to see that the phone manufacturers are excited about this as well and are already trying to get it out. Um, so that was again the LG V50 ThinQ 5G phone, which will be here in the U.S. Just not with that extra bonus screen that you can that you can put on. Which I like that kind of innovation. Actually, that's kind of a cool or I, I like that as a different way to get another you know add that extra screen on there. Um, we've got lots to go through though. So let's let's keep on going. One of the things, uh, maybe this next one, talking about cameras. I feel like more and more cameras are getting added onto phones. I don't know where the end is for that, but Nokia in particular uh, coming out with this five camera phone, the Nokia 9. Yep, so I mean, 
we've seen this company before called Light, and they made the L16, which is a camera with 16 lenses on it. So basically, HMD, which is the company that makes Nokia phones, uh, worked with Light to bring that technology into this phone, the Nokia 9 PureView. And it's all about sort of bringing back that heritage of uh, classic Nokia cameras being just exceptionally good, kind of like the Nokia Lumia 1020. Uh, this camera basically takes one shot per five cameras, so five shots, and combines it for one photo. So you're getting a super really detailed photo. Uh, the benefit here is that it takes raw plus JPEG photos, so you can then go into Lightroom and edit those raw images. And it's while the Pixel 3 or the iPhones can also save your raw photos, this, this camera takes so much more detail and information because of those five cameras that editing them in Lightroom is vastly different from editing a raw photo from a Pixel 3 or uh, an iPhone. It's just, you get so much more to work with that you can drastically alter your photos to make them look super fantastic. So we're definitely gonna be uh, testing this phone throughout this week and uh, stay tuned to Digital Trends because we may have some surprises in store. Nice. Also, a lot of time pouring over the minutiae of the details on these phones, whether the, the cameras on the rear are stacked up or whether they're raised out by a millimeter or a millimeter point two or whatnot. Uh, what's nice about this is the design of those cameras is actually integral to the design of the phone and kind of looks cool. So it's just an, we're seeing a lot of different innovations and takes on phones over here at the show, which is nice. We like uh, we like change, we like innovation, we like new ideas. Absolutely, yeah, and it feels like that's something you know over the last several years we haven't seen a lot of big innovation. Uh, coming from this this sector, but I mean, now we're starting to see more and more of this. You're right, it does look cool. I gotta say, it, the five cameras on there. And the fact that they're all working in conjunction with each other, I think that's pretty interesting. So that's the Nokia 9, uh, their new phone, and that review is up right now at Digital Trends, and it sounds like you guys are gonna be testing that out with maybe some some extra bonus surprises coming up later this week. So follow along there to, to find out about that. And since we are broadcasting live, I wanna remind everybody, if you have specific questions as we're going through these phones that you wanna ask, uh, I will certainly relay them to these guys as they're live in Barcelona, and, uh, and we'll go through those. Um, 4K. 4K is something that we're seeing more and more in phones, being able to shoot 4K. And uh, the Sony Xperia 1, do we want to go through that one next? Sure. Yeah, I just actually saw that a couple, uh, a couple hours ago. Um, so the Sony's big flagship of the year, uh, and it's sort of the first time I feel like Sony is talking to the rest of the departments in its company. <laughs> they have all these amazing technologies yeah. like you know, the Sony Alpha cameras, the Bravia TVs, Sony pictures, you know, all these different crazy uh, features. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> We're live in bars, everybody watching. Yeah, I mean, it's chaotic. You're at a conference right now. <laughs> but uh, so they have all these different um, divisions and they're finally sort of talking to each other as they're making this phone. So this phone has a 4K OLED screen and it's apparently the world's first 4K OLED screen. It also has a 21 by nine aspect ratio. So it's a super tall phone. So traditionally, now most days, uh, most phones these days are 18 by nine. So a little wider and not as tall. This phone actually kind of feels like a remote controller for your TV. Yeah, and you can see Julian's got very large hands. You can see in that video right there, it looks, I would say it looks a little more normal in your hands than it might be mine. <laughs> Somewhat of a strange shape. But that said, if it's designed specifically for cinema applications like this. Right, so the point is that um, films are mostly filmed in the 21 by nine aspect ratio. So watching something in this just looks really cinematic and cool. Sure. Um, but the other benefit is that also it works with games. But the real other benefit that it also showed us is that uh, split screen mode is actually kind of useful in this phone because it's so tall that you can get so much out of two apps in a single screen that really, you know, multitasking on this phone definitely does feel way better than multitasking on other phones. So that's another cool benefit. But there's also a crazy amount of tech in here with their triple camera lenses on the back. They're adding this cinema pro grade mode um, where basically you can try to take film, take video the same way you sort of would if you're on a movie set, you can customize the FPS, the bit rate and all this different sort of stuff. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun creatively for uh, people who really want to film or take cool photographs. And, and we don't really know much else because they're being very coy about uh, letting us play around with the devices so far, but hopefully uh, we will be checking that out soon. Cool. Um, that's, that des definitely is kind of an interesting way of a couple of different things on there. One, going for people who want to watch movies on their phone, like really targeting that is like, that's one of the primary reasons you would buy a phone. 
Um, for me personally, you know, it's an added bonus, but it's not something that I would necessarily go for, but I, I like that they're designing for that. Uh, but it seems like another theme here so far, and we've got several other phones we're gonna go through. I see questions coming in. We're gonna make sure that we get to those too. Um, they, it seems like uh, a lot of the manufacturers are really focusing on creators. Like as far as people who are creating video, creating content, editing different functions, does that seem to be kind of a theme so far? I think it varies. Uh, some manufacturers that are trying to, I think the point is that they're trying to sort of cater to uh, different types of audiences. Mm -hmm. So this phone may be better for this type of people. This phone might be better for that type of people. And I think that's a smart idea because these days, you know, there's so many phone options to choose from that are good phones that you kind of need to differentiate and you kind of need to go for a sort of target audience. Um, for example, I think, you know, uh, this phone, I actually asked this question to Don Mesa in, in Sony, and he said that, you know, uh, he definitely did mention creators, people who vlog or film, maybe they could use this phone as sort of a second camera to their main DSLR, or, or maybe this might be inspire people to film uh, video with uh, in, in this cinematic style. And I asked the same question to uh, Pekka Rantala, who is the CMO of HMD Global, and he said that, um, you know, why would someone, why, why would the main average person want to, to take a picture and have it in raw images, right? They want, they just want the JPEGs. Uh, he said that, you know, uh, it's a good learning experience for p them to teach people how to use the raw uh, images and, and edit them so that it's not too complicated for the average person. But also, he did also say that this is definitely targeted towards photo enthusiasts. So yes, I think they're starting to cater to those niche audiences so that um, they don't have to sort of fill that one overall amazing one phone. But also not really niche audiences. I mean, Steven Soderbergh has a film out in the theaters now, which was shot entirely on an iPhone, right. which I think is indicative of the power of these things, of these devices to put them in the right hands and creators can do some wonderful things. So you, I think you definitely are seeing manufacturers targeting things like that. That's interesting. Yeah, so that's the Sony Xperia 1. And I believe, do we have a review up of that one yet? Or I'm, I'm sure there will be uh, one forthcoming. Okay, so check that one out as we're walking through, just kind of running down some of the cool phones that uh, Jeremy and Julian have seen out there so far in Mobile World Congress. All right, let's get to, to this one. I mean, we, we had the Samsung event with the foldable phone out last week, but we knew that was not going to be the only one. They got their press coverage in there a couple of days early, but now we're finding out about some of the other ones, and Huawei in particular, uh, the Mate X, is it, or is it Mate 10? How do they say that? Mate X this time, yeah. It's okay. a bit deceiving. That's part of the guessing game, I feel like, with every phone that comes out now that has an X in it. Are you calling it an X or a 10? We were just wondering that. What happened to all the other letters in the alphabet? Where's <laughs> the Y? Like, why is everything X? It's got to be X. That's it. Well, with this, so the Huawei Mate, uh, let's talk about this, this new foldable phone. What do we know about it so far? Well, it seems, you know, I mean, it's, it's tough to say because we haven't really seen Samsung's that close up. I mean, I saw it close up and it was in a glass box, so we didn't get to touch it. But from purposes of intent, this phone kind of looks better than Samsung's it Galaxy Fold. It definitely looks better. You know? I mean, that's the consensus among everyone I've talked to. Like everyone who looked at the front of the Galaxy Fold was like, well, it kind of looks like an old-ish phone because it has this tiny screen covered with like these huge bezels on the front. But um, uh, the, the, you know, the front of this phone is like a normal screen and basically it unfolds and over on the back, you have an extra screen on top of that extra uh, huge massive display when you unfold it over. So you're getting sort of a triple screen uh, aspect here, which is you know kind of similar to Samsung's. Uh, not as crazy in terms of the camera department, I feel like. I mean, there are triple cameras in the back, but you know Samsung went a little overboard. Yeah, yeah. The, the hallmark here is clearly the, the folding feature itself and the, the double screens that are involved. And it is just a remarkable design. Uh, it just looks exceptionally more useful there's a there's a little ridge in the back that right. turns it into something that makes it very uh easy to carry around right if you think about think about carrying around a tablet you're generally putting your hands on the screen and maybe uh changing functionality or pushing buttons by accident this gives you a thing that you can actually hold which seems like a very smart idea. also in that clip right there you can see how thin it is which again is another thing that common thing about samsung's galaxy fold is that it's something like 17 millimeters i think whereas this is uh just short of 11 or 8 or something i think it's 11 when it's folded up completely so definitely way thinner which is nicer for your pocket i guess but um overall it's just something that we were kind of surprised by uh, but like how much of a difference it felt like yeah. compared to samsung's galaxy fold which again um we still haven't seen so i guess we can't fully comment on it could be yeah. even more amazing but 
uh, Andy Boxel, who is our senior writer, saw the phone and he also was gushing. And he, surprisingly, he said the software experience felt pretty uh, great and, and but polished. That's, that's, this is the curious thing about what's going on here. We have these two devices, both of which are, by all accounts, they're done. Like these are definitely products these companies are planning on selling. And we can't really touch them. We can't really play around with them. We can't really test out their limits and see how effective and good they are. To be fair, Huawei let us hold it for they a let brief us, they time. Let us hold it. To be also fair, uh, Samsung didn't. Uh, we <laughs> sort of asked and they said that basically they're just waiting for the launch event, which, sure. But uh, right. it, it would have been really nice to play around with these devices to get people uh, a heads up on like what really you can do with these foldable phones and, and why you would want them. Do you think that's just because they were in such a race to get these announcements out first that they just rushed it out before it's even ready for, for editors like yourselves to actually get your hands on them? That, I mean, that could potentially be it. I think that it might also be more of a um, device issue. They might not have enough devices to get people around to mm. test that. Because from these events that we're going to, there's almost only like one foldable phone unit for you to check out. So It could be I, anything. We were yeah. at the Samsung event uh, uh, two weeks ago, they were giving us an early look at some of their products. And one of the things we were testing out was the new uh, gear earbuds that they've got. It's Gal Galaxy, Galaxy Buds. Galaxy yeah. Buds, I'm sorry. Um, which I was allowed to put in my ears, but they, they wouldn't do anything because the software hadn't been optimized and it wasn't effective and didn't connect. Right. And so, that was mere days before the launch. Right. So for a lot of these things, the hardware may be done and everything may be done. It's just that there's like some last minute updates that they don't necessarily want people to see or whatever. So it makes sense and uh, totally fair, especially since it is such, sure a, radically, it such a radically new uh, product um, that, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll see it, I guess, when it right. comes out, which both of them should be pretty soon. Uh, Samsung especially is in April. So uh, I did see that Huawei's is going to be more money. It's estimated, what, like 2,600 bucks? Yeah, a little bit more, um, but I feel like so far from what I've heard, just looking around Twitter and everything, it seems like people are happy to pay. If you're, if you're going to pay that much, you know, what's a couple more hundred <laughs> right. for a... Yeah, if you're going to be one of those people that's buying that, yeah, it's probably not going to make that much of a difference in your in your decision making on it. Um, that's still, it's really interesting. So you can check that out to digitaltrends.com. Huawei also had the P30 Pro, if I'm saying that correct? Yes. And so what's, so, uh, what's new about that one? So, well, actually, so um, the P30 Pro hasn't really been announced yet. That's a phone coming next month in March uh, at, at Huawei's Paris event. Uh, we sort of uh, were given, you know, access to see the, the back of this phone, which uh, no one else has. So we sort of, you know, were able to take some pictures and see what it looks like. So this and, is uh, an exclusive right here. And I didn't just blow like some embargo by saying that, right? <laughs> this is an exclusive. <laughs> Uh, no one has seen these pictures before. Obviously, they were leaks and everything, so people thought uh, or alluded that this this is essentially what it's going to look like. You know, from a first glance, you can basically say it looks very similar to last year's P20 Pro, so not much of a surprise. But uh, the camera module is a little different. There's some indication on the text on the on the back that maybe suggests that they're going to use a new type of Leica camera, uh, a 50 millimeter, I think. Uh, so there's subtle differences, subtle things to know. And comparing it to the P20 Pro, there's you know pretty much the same, except it feels a little nicer. Uh, but basically, just a little early preview of what we can expect at uh, Huawei's March event, where they're going to announce this phone. Very cool. So exclusive right there, getting to see a little bit of those photos that you only get here from Digital Trends. So check that out, digitaltrends.com. You can take a look. Um, all right, bouncing through these, there's just so many announcements that I know we're starting to run low on time. So I want to get through uh, some more of these really cool things that we've got. I know that you wrote down something about the OnePlus 5G. Right, yeah. I mean, so there's a lot of, everyone wants to sort of get their, uh, I did have a 5G phone kind of thing. So yeah. OnePlus a prototype 5G that's kind of covered, like you literally can't see the phone at all. You can just see a screen. And it's uh, the, the demo they're showing is kind of cool. It's basically connected to a 5G network, but they are uh, game streaming. So uh, a different cloud server or whatever is processing the, the game and it's being streamed onto the phone. And that's only possible really uh, through 5G because there's low latency. So there's a guy playing the game with a controller and his his you know inputs are basically happening in real time on the screen of the of the OnePlus 60, and that's uh, or not the 60, the OnePlus phone, which we presumably don't know what, what the hell it's called. Could be the OnePlus Seven. We yeah. don't know. We don't know when it's coming out, but it's just a something that OnePlus wanted to show off that you know, hey, we're also here with the 5G. Because phone. everyone everyone has to have something to say about 5G. Walking around the floor here, which we've been doing all day, every single booth 
has something to do with 5G. And every phone manufacturer that's here is showing off a 5G phone. But there is this real disparity between the phones, the products already, the networks themselves, of course, are rolling out slowly, but we just don't have access to all of them, particularly not here. So, for example, I was at the Samsung booth, and they have a fantastic display with the Samsung 5G phones. They have, of course, a 5G phone. One of the things to note here is that it looks just like an ordinary phone. It's the same size. It's not a big fat brick. It's not power hungry and some crazy fans or anything. It looks like an ordinary phone, but it's running on a 4G network because there isn't a 5G network there to show it off on. There are small portals here and there. There are some access points where if you're near it, you can get onto a 5G feed. But in general, we're seeing a lot of 5G phones and a lot of 4G networks still. Wow. And I feel like that's going to be this kind of the theme for a while. Uh, there's another one, uh, you know, it looks like Samsung Galaxy, the S10 5G. Were you, were you able to get hands on with that one? It was. Um, you know, it feels very much like the Galaxy S10 Plus that you held that day. Yeah. Uh, a little bigger, um, bigger battery, and it can connect to 5G networks, but we didn't really get to really see a proper test. It was more of a controlled demo that they showed us of uh, how it could do streaming 4K video on a 5G service. So it was pretty neat. And, uh, Still, I'd rather just know what the price is, you know? <laughs> yeah, so they haven't even given an official price on that one yet. Is that right? Say again? Uh, have they even given an official price on that one yet? No, no price on that one and no word on what carrier prices will be for 5G service in general. So. All right. Well, so 5G, though, definitely being a big theme at MWC. All right, I know we got just a couple of minutes, so let's go on to talk about the Microsoft HoloLens, something I've been excited about, the HoloLens 2 and uh, finally getting some more information on that. Have you guys had a chance to see it or go to any of the demonstrations for it? Yeah, I went to the launch party for this device last night and then literally an hour or so ago, I was at the Microsoft booth and I got to put the HoloLens 2 on and I had a little walkthrough with it. It is very neat. It's definitely a neat product. Uh, the, the big transformation from last year, this thing is substantially more comfortable and easy to, easy to put on and easy to wear. Uh, one of the challenges with any VR headset, think about any of the ones you've seen from Oculus or even some of the VR headsets from Samsung and, and uh, LG, um, these things aren't really very comfortable. And you just, yes, it's a good experience. Yes, it's neat, but you're not gonna wear it around for two or three hours, much less uh, eight or nine hours. So the Microsoft device is very much a business product. And if you're thinking about, I don't know, you're, you, you uh, figure out how to put together some hardware or assemble an engine or something like that, you're gonna be doing that on an assembly line for eight or nine hours. You need something that's very, very comfortable. So this was, Super comfortable. Um, beyond that, the software has certainly improved a lot. The field of view is much wider, so you can see a lot of holographic imagery right in front of you. And they built this whole system that makes it easy to use. Have you seen this? I haven't they've, seen it yet. They've built buttons, so you can read, which, I mean, it just makes sense, right? But these didn't exist until Microsoft figured out a way to do this. The device can now track exactly where your fingers are, and you can reach out and press buttons. Again, just obviously an intuitive thing, but they had to figure out how to map your hands in real time such that it knows precisely where you are so it knows you're touching this, you're turning this dial, et cetera. Very neat experience. That is really cool. Because the thing with the HoloLens, I mean, I guess the frustrating thing for me is that it's not really, like you said, it's designed for industry more than an actual consumer. Like, I'm not going to go out and buy a HoloLens and have something well, probably ready to go for myself. Oh, did we lose you? I said, if, if you have $5,000, you can absolutely go out and buy one. It's, it, right. It won't for you, and you don't have a, a group of people that's going to start manufacturing uh, software so that you can use the product. Um, but, hey, go bill your money. It's your <laughs> money, Greg. Yeah, that's, okay, that's true. I guess I could. Uh, I'm not going to. But I do, I do love this idea, though, that they're advancing just in the augmented reality zone and coming up with a way to have a button. I mean, that's really, really cool stuff. Uh, so we've got that at Digital Trends. I know we've got a couple of questions coming in. I want to get those in. Anything else, though, that you want to mention with the HoloLens before I go to those? Uh, that's the real. I, I didn't have a lot of time to play around with it. We took a couple of pictures, and I'll have more of a, a hands-on experience with it later on. Um, all I would add is... Um, it's very neat. It's very much a business product. And I feel like Microsoft has taken a step back in a sense by creating something that's so cool that maybe you might like it as a consumer, but it's just not going to be a consumer product. I feel like VR today is it's fun, but it doesn't feel as compelling as some of the augmented reality demos we've seen. This would be a fantastic product on the consumer space. And it's it, Microsoft says we're just not going to do that. How many years do you think we are away before they would change their mind on that? Or is that just never going to happen? Not going to happen. Okay. 
Dang it. All right. Well, uh, let's go to another question here. We've got one from LinkedIn because uh, we are broadcasting live on LinkedIn. Hello to everybody who's found us on there. We really appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button so you get our episodes every day. Uh, let's see. And this is Christopher says, when do you think 5G coverage will make a 5G phone worth the purchase? How far out are we until it's worth buying a 5G phone? Probably in two, maybe a year or two. I think obviously it gets better to see as we go along. Uh, a lot of carriers are going to bring out those markets mid this year, I'd say, mid to late. Uh, apparently, I just saw a headline that said T-Mobile is uh, delaying their 5G service until the end of this year. So now it's you know pushed back, by surprise. Uh, basically, 2020 is probably a good year to maybe if you're considering upgrading your phone, that's the year I'd say 5G phone, yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll buy a 5G phone. And that's also the year that Apple is expected to come out with a 5G phone as well. So there'll be some real competition there, which hopefully will bring down prices of 5G devices. And also hopefully by then we know what 5G services will cost. So yeah. um, let me play devil's advocate for a second though. So this is the year that every manufacturer is coming out with these new phones. Uh, this is the year that the carriers are building out these networks. One of the things we've been seeing here is it's not just a 5G phone. Most of the time it's a manufacturer that says, Oh, it's also a foldable phone. Oh, it also does something else. Sure. So if you're if you're the kind of person that wants a very high end premium phone, you might also just get a 5G phone. And what we hear from Qualcomm and from Ericsson, the companies that make 5G hardware, is that 5G will make your 4G network move a little faster. It'll be peppier. And if you think about the issues you might have sharing bandwidth. Uh, everyone else that's on the 4G network, sometimes it just slows down because there's so darn many people there. Being the only person on a 5G network when you can get on it is certainly going to improve things. And meanwhile, the 4G speeds are just going to come up faster. So there are some advantages, but we don't know the prices. We don't right. know what it's going to cost you. I mean, is considering it it? who knows yeah. if it's worth it, we don't know what it costs. Considering the Galaxy S10 Plus is already at a thousand, I can only imagine that the bigger Galaxy S10 Plus, uh, Galaxy S10 5G is going to cost definitely like 1200, 1300, 1500, who knows, who something knows? in that range. So the price really doesn't make sense if you're like, I don't think anyone should go and look for a 5G phone, I guess is what I'm saying this year. Uh, if it happens to be a phone that's so cool, you just want it and supports 5G, then sure. But chances are you're not going to even get 5G service. It comes down to pricing. And, and to be fair, so what I heard from Qualcomm was that they think that carriers will subsidize the cost of the network. Meaning, really? if you get a 5G, you're not going to pay an extra $40 for 5G coverage from Sprint. We'll see. This we'll is, see. Yeah. This is also the year where AT&T already apparently rolled out a 5G service called 5G. <laughs> We trust what carriers say they do, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, which suddenly you stop seeing that as much uh, being advertised anymore after a little bit of backlash on that. Um, go ahead. Okay. We hope so, they oh. change it. Yeah. Uh, and again, we're broadcasting live. So I'm here in Portland, Oregon. They're in Barcelona. And thank you, everybody who's dropping in your questions uh, as we go through. So, yeah. So to answer your question, Christopher, maybe if, if you want to future proof your phone, and 5G is something you're willing to throw in, great, but you're probably not gonna really be able to use it, and so it's not really necessary to get a 5G phone right now. I think was kind of the basic, what we were finding out from that. One last thing I wanted to get to here too, uh, before we go, is uh, on the software side of things, Google Assistant. Now I know that was kind of a big announcement, Google's there uh, talking about one of their things, not necessarily, we're not really talking about the Pixel, but we're talking about uh, Google Assistant on phones. What was the news on that? So uh, it's nothing super crazy, but I mean, this is a bit of a big deal because uh, assist, they're, they're, you can see they're trying to get Assistant into more uh, phones. They're trying to expand the capabilities of Assistant on phones. So one of the cool things is um, uh, Google Assistant is now coming to the default texting app on Android phones. So that's Android messages. Uh, most Android phones come with it as the default option. So basically now uh, when you say, I'm texting Jeremy and I say, hey, let's go to uh, this restaurant for dinner. Uh, you'll get a little pop-up that sh shows this restaurant's name. You can tap it, and the system will pull up a card that gives you all the information. Like, uh, for example, if you search that restaurant, and Google would give you that information. It's that card almost, and then you can either inject that into the conversation, uh, and then the person you're texting can see that stuff and say, "Oh, let's call that number," or "Let's look at what we use." Or so it's a little, uh, little nice touch of having assistant as an option if you want, and not necessarily something that's just totally baked into uh, the app. Uh, if you it just will contextually understand what you're talking about and suggest things, and you can totally ignore it. If you don't want what to I like it. about this is uh, I like assistants that are proactive. We have a lot of voice assistants that we're all getting very familiar with, and it's usually it's a very it's a one-to-one -one thing. You ask for help. You say, "Tell me about the weather. Tell me what my schedule is for the day." 
Here it's assistant is just realizing something's going on and proactively feeding some information that you might like. That's artificial intelligence that works, if you ask me. Right, yeah, doing the work for you before, before you have to think through that side of it. And I love the fact that it's an option too. You don't have to have that pop up every time. How long until that rolls out on, uh, on different devices? Good question. Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm okay. sure it's uh, next couple of weeks or if not months. I think it's Android 9 Pi, right? Uh, I think it's not necessarily based on the operating system oh, you have, okay. but uh, it might just be a future update rolled into the Android Messages app. Okay. Well, you can check out all of this news, all of these reviews, everything we're talking about at digitaltrends.com. And Julian and Jeremy, I want to thank you guys so much for being there, putting in the long hours, you know, getting little sleep, but bringing us all this information about so many different products at the same time. That's a lot of work. That's hard work to get that out there, but that's why uh, we love, you know, digital trends and uh, going, to the, <clears throat> excuse me, going to the website and checking all of that out. So you guys, thank you so much. What's next on the docket today? Some food, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> We've been up for 14 or 15 hours and haven't uh, eaten or slept and I can't even remember anymore. <laughs> All right, go, uh, go take a break. Maybe set down your phone for a minute and, uh, and eat some food. You're in Barcelona. It's awesome. You guys, thank you so much. And, uh, and again, follow along everything there at digitaltrends.com. Uh, that was Julian Chocatu, Jeremy Kaplan, right there in Barcelona for our coverage of MWC. And for everybody watching live, thank you for tuning in to us right now. We really do appreciate it. We're across all kinds of different platforms, and we're here every day, 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, bringing you all of the latest news when it comes to tech, interviews, all kinds of things. Earlier in the show, we had Nicole Rainey and kind of ran through some of the non-mobile news that's going on in the world of tech today because there are some other things. Uh, so we have that. You can go back and watch that at any time. But for Mobile World Congress, for, w, uh, for MWC, go to digitaltrends.com. Take a look at everything we have going on there. Follow up if there's something specific you want to know about. You know, some people want to know more about 5G. We've got lots of articles walking through 5G. You can check that out and all these individual phones. We get the hands-on reviews. So you can take a look there as well. Tomorrow on the show, we've got Ronan Glan, who's going to be on to talk about some really cool things in the world of tech and automotive. In particular, I think he's going to run down some more details about the possible Apple iVan, which is not an iCar, an iVan that Apple may be coming out with. So we'll have Ronan on to kind of give us his expert opinion on that. And as usual, we're, we'll bring you up to date on all the latest tech headlines and everything else that's going on in the world of technology. Hit subscribe wherever you're finding us to make sure you get that notification when we do go live. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow with more Digital Trends Live. <laughs>